So, um, uh, first of all, I, I assume many, most of you are here are licensed uh, psychotherapists. And I'm, I'm curious if you are, uh, like what drove you to come here was you personally want to be interested for yourself or you're thinking, oh, may, maybe an application for my patients? Who, who's, who's for the, for the, for the personal interest? Both, okay. <laughs> so, so personal interest also, because you know, um, I, um, like, like Douglas said, I, I have like a very formal training. Uh, all my, my family of origin, all Western doctors, and very dedicated to research and the scientific viewpoint. And then I, kind of like, on a, I took a left turn somewhere, and I became interested in mind-body therapies and and, uh, and this, uh, the philosophy behind that. I, and I uh, studied personally. Uh, that's where I met my wife, actually, with Carlos Castaneda. So that was a very unscientific approach. Uh, even though he had a very scientific view of it, but it was not, um, it was, you know, uh, the world as seen from an energetic standpoint, which is not the way we look at it from Western medicine. Even though nowadays there's some, uh, we are moving closer, like for example, there's a, a new term being coined in, in, in scientific circles, which is biofield, and it's essentially, I many of you may have be familiar with it, but it's looking at the, all the, the uh, very low output energy signatures that regulate and maintain all the, the biological hemodynamic activities in the body. So we have a basis that we are coming together, and, and the idea is to look at how uh, we can have an, uh, an effect on our, on our body functions through uh, changing our perception of things. How we are thinking uh, in our consciousness about a topic creates a whole cascade of events in the body-mind that regulate a little bit of what's going to be the outcome. So uh, our perceptual field is of the key essence. How we are describing, how you or your patients are describing to themselves what just happened. The belief that we put at it, the associations we give to it. And so changing our perceptual approach to what is becomes a, a heightened uh, value nowadays. And uh, I think the, the two things I'd like to present today is one is uh, we take the whole package of sexual energy with all the perceptual associations that we have about what that is, what does it mean, how does it play out, and we, I wanted to, to, uh, to kind of shift it to looking at it as sexual energy is life force. So we can even like change the, the uh, the, the, the way you name it in your consciousness. If you think of it as life force, then a whole other set of associations will come through and possibilities to work with that, that is, that we do think of sexual energy. If we look at sexual energy, then all the socialization, how we come in to understand what does that mean, will interfere with our direct experience of it. So life force, and then the second thing, so that's like a, the conceptual framework of how to think of it. And the second one is, okay, if it's a life force, what can I do with this life force? So what can I do with my sexual energy? How can sexual energy be something that can be actually uh, integrated and, and deployed in, our, in ourselves, in our life, differently than how we normally associate sexual energy? Here's yes, a broader spectrum of, of approach. And so let's, let's see what we have here. This is actually a presentation that I've uh, given some time ago, and, and uh, it's a little bit tweaked for you guys. But these are both the, uh, the objectives that we stated in the, for all of you. So I would say to, to uh, enhance my understanding of sexual energy and to learn practices for directing my sexual energy for vitality, energy, and youth, and nutritional information for handling sexual energy and balancing hormones. Uh, we'll see if we can get to this last one, but I, I have some really good slides on different foods and things what we can do to, to enhance different uh, functions in our sexual life. So if we don't get to, they will be in the, in the YouTube, you can access them online. But um, let's see, let, let's start because you know, part of my training with, uh, with Castaneda was, was it's all about the experience, where right? we have to enter into something not just intellectually, but we need to bring it into the body experience. Right? So, uh, put your, both your feet on the floor, and super simple, hands on your lap, and just let your eyelids descend. So they touch each other, the eyes are closed. Uh, 
Just take three deep breaths at your own pace, just so that you are present into your body, because the breath brings our awareness into our body, into our present time. And so I just want you to have, have a moment to take count inside of you. Where am I with my sexual energy today? Myself, as a therapist, as, a, as an individual in this planet. Uh, you don't have to say it out loud, it's just for you to come into a relationship with yourself. And we always start with the, the question, the asking, being available to ourselves. How am I doing with my sexual energy today? Am I depleted around it? Am I really enjoying it nowadays? Is it uh, has become a duty that I'm supposed to? And just take a moment just to be with that. No judgments to yourself. Just really come in honestly to be in contact with what is. Now from there, so a, a little more in connection with yourself, we can, I invite you to, uh, to, to listen and to take in whatever I say or what you see, uh, not just uh, uh, intellectually, but get the feeling of it, get the intuitive part of you coming in, so we apprehend the information from more than just our thought process. You know, in, in, uh, in science now, we, we speak of three brains, right? The, the cranial brain, the cardiac brain, and the gut brain. And each one has a distinct uh, service for the whole. So we want to bring in the, the feeling, the intuitive part, and the heart. So, as I said, sorry, sexual vital energy, sexual energy, life force. Sexual energy, vital energy. So these associations, right? It's not just about sex, it's about much bigger than that. It's our, our basic creative force. Um, if you think of it, you know, it, 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 all of you have all this clinical experience and all the training. How do, we, how do we learn to use sex? What do we use sex for? We can use it for, for well, the, the, the most immediacy is for love and connection. We can use it for procreation, to have babies. We can use it for, as a means of control. Uh, we can use it as a, as a currency. I give you sex and I get something, right? It would be a variety of things. That socially, we learn that we can get that way. What are the ways that in you know that you can, we can use sexual energy? To regulate. To regulate. So if someone is, for example, really you know, bent up, excess, you know, in Chinese medicine we speak of deficiency and excess um, constitutions, right? An excess uh, person or in an excess moment, a lot of bin, build up energy, and so a, a release of sexual energy can actually regulate. I'm not sure if that was how you were thinking of it or differently, yeah, definitely can regulate. At the same, in the same way, uh, if we're not aware of our, our, our general state, the use of sexual energy in the opposite situation may totally drain us, right? So um, we could look at sexual energy as a, uh, from the perspective of uh, uh, accounting. So we, we are, let's say we are, we are all accountants and we have a certain quota of energy in our bank account and we have to manage it on a day-to-day -day basis because if sexual energy is vital energy, that means that anything I'm gonna do in my life, I need to have my sexual energy available. I can deploy it in a, in a sexual act, or I can deploy it in an action in my life, or in I'm really uh, involved in a project, I want to really get the project going, and I need a lot of creativity, and a lot of drive for this project to, to be born, and so I can utilize my sexual energy. I have a, so if I look at this as an accountant, in an accounting of energy po point of view, then it's about how am I managing my vital energy. I can deploy it through sex or I can deploy it in other ways. And how I am feeling, then that could inform me. So the approach of as an accountant, that was something that uh, comes from the shamanistic principles. And we can definitely, we've been teaching this 
for 20 years and we have come to see that definitely it applies clinically. Uh, it's a very useful way. Uh, let's say, for example, because I wanted to, this is not in the slides, but I wanted to, to give that as a, as a practical nugget, right? So, uh, one of the things you can do or you can have a patient do is, okay, so you, you wake up in the morning and you give yourself a rating of, of how, much, how much my vital energy, how my energy feels like I'm at like 50%, I'm at 70%, I'm at 20%, right? So it's all about being in connection with where you are. So you give yourself a rate and then you, you know that some things will make you more energized, some things will drain you, right? Arguments may drain you. Or, or certain activities that you are resisting may drain you, and uplifting ones may give you energy. And so you put in all your, so you, this framework you apply to sexual energy. So thinking about your know, sexual thoughts, um, are, are they draining me or are they distracting me? Or are they giving me a boost? Uh, if I, if I, yeah, how am I engaging my sexual energy? Masturbation or I, I'm having sex too often? Or maybe in the nights I get too tired because sex in the morning, the, 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 the young, so it, naturally in the body, it's, a, a morning sex is better than a night sex because the night time is more the restoration and renewal time of the, in, the, in the biological rhythms. So it's more likely to drain us late night sex than morning or, or early afternoon sex. So depending on how my bank account is doing, I'm going to maybe choose to move my, my sex in a different time of the day so that I don't lose so much energy, or if maybe it gives me a boost. If I have sex during the day, I, I feel super energized. If I do it at night, the next morning I'm dragging. So looking at uh, uh, both the ac actions of sex and the thoughts around sex, because the, the way we, our mind pro processes, uh, not the sexual act itself, but all the, uh, the interactions around the sex, you know, what the partner did, did not say, uh, you know, I get maybe hours and hours thinking about something that happened with my sexual partner and it drains me, distracts me. So I lose energy by how am I approaching my thoughts about the topic. So you go about the day thinking in terms of energy gains or energy losses. And then you at, the, at night you do an accounting. You know, how was my energy and wh how did I handle my sexual energy today? How was my accounting for the day? I, I do my books. And then, and then the next day, so it gives you, it takes it out of any uh, re hindrances coming from the story that we give around sex. And it puts it into a very functional framework of accounting that anybody can relate to. And then we become, by doing this, what happens is that we get into a first, a, a much more, uh, we get into a relationship of awareness with ourselves. And this, at the end of the day, is what we're looking for. How can we become more aware about who I am, how am I handling my energy, and what is sex doing to me? There's definitely, in the accounting, different foods are going to increase or decrease my energy, my vital energy. Sleep, uh, the cultivation of all, you know, if we, if we are in an in a uplifted state of being, uh, we are happy, we are, in, you know, uh, we easily get surprised, we get engaged in things, uh, the vital, vital force will increase. And so our availability of our sexual energy will also increase. Um, the thoughts, we will get into it in a second because that's critical. Basically, we uphold everything, how we relate to sexual energy, by how we are thinking about it, right? Our perceptual standpoint is it. And the intent, our intention, that also, uh, if I have an intention of, um, I really want to create something new in my life. Uh, that's a, a big yearning for my spirit. So that intention is going to naturally redirect sexual energy into output of something, creativity in the life. So uh, it may be less available for the actual sexual act because the intent is that it's redirected into a different output. And that is perfectly fine like that. If someone has a lot of sexual energy or let's say vital force, how, how do we see someone with a lot of vital force? These are things that, that uh, we don't think of but they, are, they come across. A shine in the eyes, 
Like there's something in, when you look at them, there's something like really a, it's, it's inviting about in the eyes, right? They're, they're present, they're engaged, their vital force is active. That can be definitely seen. Uh, there's a mood of curiosity and presence that I was telling you. Uh, magnetism. You just, you just like being around those people. Uh, it just feels good. There, there's something positive, uplifting about being around someone whose vital force is available and deployed. And this is what I was telling you, you know, if, if I'm looking at sexual energy bigger than just how I have sex and so forth, then it beckons the question, what do I want to do with it? Where in my body could I send it to? Can I actually, let's say I'm having digestive issues, I'm having a, a heart condition, whatever it is, I'm having problems focusing. Can I use my sexual energy to feed and support that organ? And the answer is absolutely yes, we can do that. Um, well, <laughs> these are some, some statements. I'm not sure if I want to go into that for time's sake. Um, do any of these statements really <laughs> trigger your curiosity? Do you have a question about any of them? <laughs> These are some, some, uh, some things that, uh, uh, from my experience and from things that my teacher would say in terms of how we are socialized, you know, how we are socialized to go about sex. And, um, and a lot of it has to do with um, the socialization is, you know, like my teacher would say, we have, we have lived in a man, in a world written by men for men. And sorry guys for us, but we've been on the, on the, on the receiving end of a lot of privilege and time's up. <laughs> <laughs> no pun intended. Uh, so there is this uh, standpoint, right, that the man deserves and the woman has to serve. And that's, uh, needless to say, old. Not, not applicable to our days. We, we wanted to, uh, looking for a shift, a, a co-partnership. And, um, and so how we engage in sex is huge in the socialization model, right? And so uh, can the man step out? Like, you know, I, I, have, I have a patient of mine who was recently um, uh, recalling an interaction with, with, with uh, an old girlfriend where um, he was young and uh, and he, of course, was he as a man was like you know I go to a party and I want to have sex and, and I, you know, if she doesn't if she doesn't explicitly say no she must mean yes and so uh, you know, long story short they 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 ended up having sex but uh, but he was and his own account she was like not too engaged you know I don't know why you know but she didn't explicitly say no so he assumed that she was fine with it and and then it turns out that the for her, the experience had been very, very different. It had been almost like uh, an abuse uh, of boundaries. And so that led to a lot of issues with him. But w the point here was that he genuinely didn't even realize. He genuinely thought that it would be OK, just because that's how things are. So can, can, as men, can we step into an awareness of uh, where is she at? You know, step out of our cocoon of how we are just going and just, you know, we are the king in the room. And where is she at? So the willingness to put my perception in, in the perception of the other. And the second one is, for the woman in kind, is can she enter into a, a, a congruency with her inside and then say, speak and say, no, I don't, I don't really want to do this now. Uh, use use the words and and uh, and then if there's if both things are there if if there's an expression of our genuine self and there's a listening and a, and a willingness to empathize then then we have a co-creation and so this interfacing is going to lead to a lot better use of our sexual energy because a lot of the you know uh, if 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 someone if if I if I uh, have an orgasm then there is a release of vital force. There is a, a, say, a loss in a way, but it doesn't have to be a loss if there's a regulation about it. But uh, if there's a certain component of biologically of our, our force that gets goes down, but a perhaps bigger amount of energy entanglement is going to be by the story that I tell myself around what happened this in this intimate moment. So uh, 
Reviewing the story that we tell ourselves is another way that we can definitely impact our vital force. And, and clearing the misunderstandings within myself and pinpointing what things need clarification, you know? Uh, because we assume something and then we take it as such based on our prior experience of it. And, uh, you know, in, in the studies they show nowadays that uh, an event in consciousness only is maintained for a few seconds. So after that, immediately it's stored. First, you know, initial memory uh, storage, and then uh, it's reprocessed, uh, and then it goes into the long-term memory, right? But it's very, very short. Our data point is very small, and it's, most of it is filled in by memory associations and beliefs in the past. So any event around sex has a lot of charge, you know, as you know. If we can, as another, another uh, technique that, uh, that is very useful for shamanism, I do a review, you go to sleep at night, and you do a quick review of where you got entangled in your sexual energy that day. What story, what happened, they, 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 made, they made a gesture to you, it made you remember when a man you know, did something inappropriate in the past, and then you got all day triggered. There's a lot of things, right? There's the, the PTSD uh, triggers, there's also associations in terms of our, our perception of something. So where did my energy get entangled? And so then what you do is you simply, uh, in your consciousness, you review it, because that's how you bring it back. An event in consciousness will only stay for a few seconds unless we deliberately re-visualize it and relive it. And when we do so, we have a chance to do a memory reconsolidation. So we can, we can shift the, the emotional and the perceptual associations to what we get, that event, and we can change where, which five carbon is going to go in. And that's critical. We can really change things by stepping in with our consciousness and deliberately recapitulating the event, changing the perceptual association, and then filing it again. Because when it goes to long-term memory consolidation, it's going to be in a file that is going to be much more freeing for us. So we can actually rewrite our story all the time as it's being written. You can do the same thing with events that happened a long time ago. It just takes a little more, you know, more, maybe you have to do it a few times, you know, if it's a, an event that's been really you know, impregnated already and filed, then you, you know, to bring it out, you have to kind of maybe review it a few times, but you can. This is a, 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 something that is available to us in our biology, in our brain chemistry, and, and uh, uh, we, the invitation that I want to give to all of us is, we can actually be uh, in command, we can be a player in our inner world about how we, uh, the story around sexual energy, the application of sexual energy, and how we, we experience it in our daily lives, uh, rather than being a, you know, oh, it's just, I'm like that, it happens, and I, you know, you can, we can actually change things from the inside a lot. So all of that was for, what are these? Um, yeah, let's move on because of time. This is a little what I was telling about this, about the recapitulation. This is some, you don't need any of this, right? This is some biology. Um, this is an interesting uh, uh, conception from biology and also um, from shamanism, which is, in a, in a way, when, when, uh, when there was no meiosis, when it was just mitosis, uh, then in, in, basically biology was immortal, right? Because you reproduce exactly the same in the next generation. But then for diversity purposes, the forces of evolution split us, and now we get diversity, but then that means that we are unique individuals. We can't. The, the progeny is not going to be exactly like we are. We want to really, exp we want to reproduce ourselves into the, into the next generation, and that causes a lot of issues. So we, we are not going to be, nobody's going to be the same as we are. We're going to have a different entry into anything around sex because we are unique, and that's part of our, our biological diversity. 
This you all are very familiar with, all the different layers in our brain where we engage around sex. Um, number three, that's the one we want to highlight. If I'm doing a recapitulation, for example, here we have, I, I'm, I'm in my frontal lobe here, and then I have my limbic brain in front of me, and with my attention, I can actually go to any place in my human body and, and reside there and see things from there. So I can go to my frontal lobe, and I'm, okay, now I'm connected to my higher brain functions. The prefrontal cortex is all the, the correlates with all the empathy, insight, um, uh, you know, the capacity to project ourselves into other places, and all those traits are actually a part of our, our biological and our consciousness um, um, storage. So I can be, as they say, I had a, a, an exchange with my boyfriend, and it was, uh, it was messy. I, 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 you know, he's, you know, the story got triggered, let's say, whatever the story is. And so I'm just, you know, it goes on and on in my head, and I, I am just trapped, and I feel bad, and I feel stressed, and then I, you know, I, I, I'm constipated, so there's all these biological things that happen, all because I'm, I'm caught in the story, right? You've seen it over and over with your patients. So I can go, okay, I'm gonna, I'm gonna I take a few breaths, and then I'm, I'm gonna go to my frontal lobe, and I'm going to, my, my consciousness, I'm gonna be sitting in my, in my prefrontal cortex. I'm gonna be looking uh, uh, like a screen, that's the limbic system, they are deep in the brain, and there's where the mess of the story is playing out. And I'm like caught, right, because that limbic system is in control, is in command of, of my body-mind. But I can split my awareness and I can look at it, and I can do a meditation, so there's a lot of connections uh, uh, between the frontal lobe and the limbic system, and the limbic system can be modulated from the frontal lobe. So I can actually, come and, and, and as I review the, this event, I can tell myself a different story about it. I can give a context, because in the moment, we, like I say, we, we usually use a very small amount of actual data in the moment, and then the rest of it, we fill it in with our, with our prior experiences and memory. So we can actually look at it again and go, oh, no, actually, I didn't see that, or maybe I should have asked that, and it's not that bad, and, and as I'm doing that, I'm breathing. It's very important to keep the breath flowing because that keeps things flowing in the, in the body-mind. And then I start to re-regulate the limbic system impulses. And so I can remodulate, and then that experience is gonna be filed in a different place. So this is a, a little bit how you work out this recapitulation technique, and now it has a biological base to it. In women under stress, Blood flows to the frontal lobe. This is a functional MRI study. Blood flows into the frontal lobe. In men, the blood flows to the brain stem. Interesting. How men resolve stress and how women resolve stress, very different. Is that because men fight and women have to think of how to get out of the situation? Well, that's part of it, right? It's, it's a, there, there's a, a historical base of that, and there's a socialized base for that. Um, but there's also a biological, you know, there's, you know, the, the chicken and the egg. What, what came first? The, the, the biology in women is naturally that flows that way, or does it happen because of behavior, right? Probably the first one is more stronger, the biological, uh, than, than the... But, you know, nowadays with epigenetics, we understand that... Uh, the environment can really have a deep impact in, in what happens in the body. I would say, for example, in base of what we were just discussing is that even though this is what happened naturally, we can actually change this. So I can direct my, my flow to go to my prefrontal cortex and out of my brainstem uh, as a man, even though it may unconsciously go there because that's what happened. Uh, again, I really want for you guys from to take from today is I can be a player. I can actually do things. I can change things. Uh, I can literally change things, especially in how the brain is working in function. Uh, I'm not sure if you're interested in any of this. Probably not. Maybe yes. But, uh, let's keep going. This is a view of shamanism, how this vital energy, this vital force comes in. 
uh, and is part of it is, is at conception and part of it is at birth. So there's a um, you know l you know vital force you know s you know sexual vital energy. Uh, we get imprinted a chunk of that at the moment of conception, and and then the other chunk comes throughout gestation. So there's a, a biological component, which is you know the quality of of the gestation process, you know, food of a mother, the environment of the emotions of a mother, um, then the, the, the genes themselves, uh, and then the birth process. But then there's, there's, in shamanism, there's a, we, we look at what were the conditions in which our parents uh, conceived us. If, if our parents were, in a, in a, they were excited, they were like present, they were like super there, then there's a, there's a there's an imprint of more energy, more sexual, more vital force in the person. If our parents were like super bored, they didn't want to be there, they were like, ah, I don't want to do this, then we have, we have to work extra hard to generate vital force. So uh, I don't know if this in any way comes into your uh, practice, but um, you know, to dig into if someone has a, uh, you know, a lack of energy and, and a kind of more tendency to, to have a negative outlook of things, and so forth, you know, you can inquire about um, how was it, if they know how their parents, the circumstances of their parents when, when they conceived him or her. Um, regardless of, and this is uh, in Chinese medicine also, there's a very similar conception. It actually is identical uh, to the shamanistic view. In Chinese medicine, all the, the medicine of, you know, Eastern medicine is based on this principle, which is there's a, um, a we call it prenatal energy, which is precisely what you come with uh, at the conception, and then there's uh, the postnatal energy, which is what comes after you are you are in this physical form, and the, both of them form our basis of our, our, our pool of energy. Another thing is that um, this you may you may come across it or not in your practice, but there's a, um, a correlation between the, this number two, turbulence around sexual experiences, meaning you know, anything that, that uh, activates uh, stress or, or fear or tension around the story in the sexual experience, the interaction, the partner, or the sexual act itself. Um, and some, uh, as a, as a, a basis for the, for the development of fibers and tumors in the, in the uterus in particular, but it could be any of the reproductive system, uh, ovaries um, and so forth. But very often um, a patient that has a lot of fibroids, I would have them uh, recapitulate, directed recapitulating the sexual interactions and, and cleaning the associations from that. Because it's like the, the wrapping of all those uh, experiences, in a way, it's like the, the wrapping of the tumor. And so unraveling those experiences helps the, 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 the body to, to undo the tumors or to decrease the formation and the rate of formation of tumors. So there's a correlation between what the body is physically doing and then our story. How we are perceiving ourselves is not happening in a, in a different track than what the body is doing. In a clinic all the time, I'm seeing how the two condition each other. Would that be the same for polyps and also endometriosis? Any, any, kind of, uh, any kind of, yes, absolutely. Any kind of uh, congestions or stagnations, yep. Oh, this is another thing here. Uh, number four, I don't know if this, uh, this is not really part of our socialized upbringing, right? When we never, nobody tells us, hey, you know what, maybe you, you think about being celibate for a little while. A little while, maybe a month, maybe a few months, maybe a year, um, maybe a week. But the idea of withholding our sexual energy for purposes of re having it available for other issues, like learning more about who I am, understanding myself better, for example, if someone is, is having a really difficult time in, in, your, in your therapy, uh, you may consider suggesting to them uh, to refrain from sexual energy for, for a little bit while they're working the issue. 
it will ha because again, it's sexual energy is vital energy. So if I don't deploy it in the sexual act and in the in the mindset of being thinking about sex, then it's going to be available for other things like uh, better resolution of, of internal issues or a health event that you want more vital energy available to recover. Then you don't want to drain it too much in the sex. All these crossovers, because the understanding of, of sexual energy is, and I want to go actually go into uh, this uh, circuitry. This is obviously uh, a part of not just shamanism, it's also part of oriental medicine and martial arts practice, meditation practices. You know, meditation is, is there's so much studies and information coming through about the real impacts of meditation. Really, I mean, telomeres, the, 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 the main, uh, see, the, the, the long, long shelf life of a cell depends on the capacity to, for the cell to reproduce and repair. And the telomere is the part of the, in, in the uh, DNA that allows that process to happen. So uh, shorter telomeres, shorter lifespan, shorter vitality. Longer, the opposite. So we want to lengthen telomeres, right? That's a big interest in, in uh, anti-aging. Meditation, immediately, just one meditation uh, set, sitting already shows lengthening of telomeres. And it has uh, down regulation of cortisol uh, output, I mean, all kinds of biological markers coming through in research about meditation states. Meditation is the act of being, like I told you, like I, we did a moment ago with uh, how you close your eyes and just connect to where am I with my sex today. That's meditation. It's the, the act of just being present with yourself and whatever is in front of you. So, uh, very useful in, in, in uh, for example, if in, uh, in any kind of uh, sexual activity uh, to bring in a meditation state to it rather than being just unconscious about it. It makes a huge difference. And uh, um, I highly recommend it to, to entice your, your patients in this way. So here's a basic circuitry, uh, going up and down from the front or going up from the back and down from the front. So if I inhale naturally, I'm bringing the energy down with the breath, right? So it's an easy way to, to use the circuitry in a one cycle of, of in respiration. So you inhale and you directly send it here. So quickly inhale here and then up along the spine and to the top of the head. And then when you exhale, you bring it back down to the belly. And inhale up and exhale down. And that circuitry circulates sexual energy. So it doesn't get, sometimes, uh, like for example, uh, you, you, may, you may know of, you might have heard of uh, practices to uh, hold your orgasm. And so the way to do that is to circulate the energy. So it doesn't get, uh, it, it, when, it, when the moment of the climax is approaching, the energy is, con is concentrated in this pelvic area, and one can feel it. And so if you can redirect it, redistribute it again, then the climax will subside, and the energy keeps flowing, rather than being just then lost out. You can do that in the moment of sex as a way to regulate the experience and be more in a meditative state. You can do it regardless of the sexual act, just to circulate vital energy. Uh, for example, let's just do it quickly. Why not? Since we are, since we are talking, so it's only a talking, right? So sit again with your feet on the floor. This will be super simple, super easy. And uh, close your eyes, and then uh, first of all, connect to the pattern of the breath. So inhale is uh, bringing in the energy of the breath into the lower belly. And then imagine it goes up along the spine. You can visualize it. And then it comes back down the front. So first, just, just to informally tune into the circuitry. With your inner mind, you can absolutely do this easily. Imagine that the a, a force is rising up along the spine from the sacrum to the top of the head, and then pauses in the crown, and then it naturally comes down the front all the way to the, to the perineum, let's say, to the very bottom of your body. And then see if you can now then match the breath to that circuit. So inhaling up the spine to the crown, exhaling down the front 
to the lower abdomen. And you play it out whatever way it works for you. Just get into this easy, simple, circular flow. You match the, the feeling of the movement of the energy with the breath. Easily done in such a way that you become a circular, circular being. And things can flow, and you can direct that flow with your own intention. And now imagine that you're, you're catching the sexual energy at the pelvis, and you're bringing it up the spine and down the front. Sexual energy is rising up to different places, and then it, as it comes down the front, it may distribute to the heart, to whatever organ, if you have any organ that you feel like is weak in this moment in your, in your body. You have a digestive issue, you have an issue with your lungs, whatever organ it needs, then as you go in the circuitry and coming around from the front, send it to one of these organs. You can absolutely do this. This is an available experience to any one of us. All right, open your eyes. This is a description of what we just did. If you want to just have it, and you'll have this in the slide. But this is a super, super easy way that can be practiced. Uh, let's say someone has a, 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 you know, you're working with a patient, they have, they have a lot of sexual energy issues, uh, for whatever kind, clinically. Uh, and we know that the, 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 to circulate this, to open up this, the thought, the story about it, uh, if you have physical issues associated with it, then this is something that can help them as you work with them. Nowadays, you know, 21st century, we, have, we know too much about the intersection between consciousness and, and biology and about uh, the plasticity of the brain and a, a lot of things that we, we can't just go by all models. We have to incorporate this. This is part of uh, the way we practice uh, therapy uh, is going to incorporate these things because this is how, what's available to us. This is another, another, another movement for, for working with sexual energy. Uh, this may, may be, it may be a, um, I, I'll show you one thing, because this may be a little bit, uh, I doubt that you would be doing with a patient, but you might, but for yourself. But it's say this, uh, there's a lot of blocked sexual energy, right? Someone has uh, you know, an addiction to sex or, or a lot of issues of trauma around sex, and there's a lot of just blocked energy. So then uh, with a simple breath, you could have it expanding like this, the hands to the side, and inhaling, and then exhaling, going like this. So inhale. You exhale forcefully, and you just bring the hands together, cross them in front of the of the, of the genital area, and that helps to break down the blockage. Right? Breath, the breath is super useful to circulate sexual energy. Um, and, uh, and the hands gesture is a way to direct our attention, actually. So that's, that's a simple one that you can also do. This for for the ones who train in, uh, in Eastern, Eastern approaches, Chinese medicine, or all Eastern, Eastern uh, conception of, uh, of sexual energies has a similar base. The vital force of sex nourishes organs. The brain, the kidneys, the sperm, and the ovum. It's a nourishing type of energy. Sexual energy can be redirected to manifest other kinds of energy. You know, and the, the, the basics of, uh, of the equation of is that energy is, can only change, right? Like matter, it can only change. It doesn't, doesn't really get lost or created. 
So we can use sexual energy for sex or we can use it for nourishing organs, for health purposes. We can use it for creativity. We can do all kinds of things, <laughs> that's the idea. All kinds of things. And the kidneys are very important in, in, uh, in Chinese medicine uh, regarding our, our, our sexual energy and our libido. So if we have uh, issues with arousal, impotence, uh, low sexual drive, then the idea of nourishing the kidneys, you, you may want to entertain that thought because it will give a lot of help to the person. Sometimes any one of those things, I want to mention it, can be caused by a blockage and not by a deficiency. So you have to kind of see the person is like red complexion, forceful voice, you know, strong physically, then maybe, and they're having like low libido and, and all those things. It may be that it's not that they are deficient in the kidneys, that maybe they're just like too bound up. They need to just let, let loose, right? So in those cases, you need to circulate and then that will arise, the libido will come up by itself. But, but if, uh, unless that is, you need to nourish the kidneys, give good foods, have a sleep early, don't have sex later after 10 p.m., um, things like that. My patients are always, they always like, when I tell them not to have sex late, they always they want to check with their partners because, you know, it's, uh, you get into grooves, right? We have sex, that, you know, it depends on our, our family schedule. But, but the truth is that energetically, physically, uh, if, you, if the person is depleted, uh, it's, it's going to be a, a, a big plus to refrain sex in late night because that's a time for actually renourishing. And if you are spending it, then you, you get a debt. This is part of what we've been talking, right? Sexual energy is not just in the sexual organs. It's in all the organs of the body. So, and again, a takeaway is this, this, the, even the thought of it, that I could actually take sexual energy and send it to different places. I can send it to different parts of my body. This is one, this is one that is, that's very useful for, because you know, if we think of uh, what is the, the number one, the number one challenge for the 21st century, what would you say it is for human beings? How, what's gonna be the number one challenge for you? I mean, let's put it aside global warming, I know that. <laughs> but let's say in terms of uh, ourselves, right? Uh, the studies that show is that it's stress, stress, all the old fashioned stress, because things are getting so fast, so full, so much information and simultaneously available and expected to be responded simultaneously as well. The load of the, of the system, our, our, our fight or flight responses, our autonomic nervous system regulation is like taxed to the maximum and it's only gonna get more. So how we, how we handle, right, mental burnout, uh, uh, physical issues. So sexual energy can be a great tool to assist us. Let's say, for example, I want, I'm, I'm in, a, in a mental funk, right? And I want to get some more clarity, get more focus, more concentration, I have a meeting, I have a uh, challenge uh, in front of me the next day. So um, let's do one more practice, one more practice. Feet on the floor. And, and uh, I'm just giving you some small samples because of course this is a very simple, one hour lecture, but, but um, again, connect to, to your own internal. You have the, the thought and your attention is where? Inside of you, right? This is about you and yourself. And now what we want to do is we want to make this connection. I want to bring sexual energy into my prefrontal cortex, into the top of my head, the front of my brain, in the front of my skull. And so the same thing, use your breath as a vehicle. The breath is the easiest and most available vehicle to use to direct energy to different parts of the body. So inhaling and then feeling the rise of the energy from the pelvis to the front of the brain. And then it hangs a little bit at the end of the inhale and you hold the breath for maybe two or three seconds and then it naturally descends as you exhale, right? 
It's almost like the energy hitchhikes and goes with the inhale up to the brain. Then you hold the breath a little bit and the energy kind of bathes the brain. And then when you exhale, the breath goes down, but keep the energy up there. Don't bring the energy back down. Almost in your intention you can do this. It's a subtle difference. Rising up with the inhale, bathing the brain with this vital energy, bringing more clarity, more focus, more presence. And then reset naturally as you exhale. But the emphasis is in the lift and the inhale. And just do a few cycles of that. As if you're splashing some, some force into the brain. And if it comes naturally, you can bring a color to it. You can bring a sound to it. Whatever traps your attention deeper, that's the key. And when you do something like this, you know, typically you get distracting thoughts or we cook up into some other thing that's going on and we, we lose it, right? The moment you realize, oh, I went to China, just come back and just come back right into do the same thing. So uh, don't waste time analyzing your distractions. When you're working with your attention internally, when you're off, all that matters, when you realize that you went off, just come back in, that's all. And um, like I said, we are, we're probably wrapping up now, but uh, this is, uh, this is my small for, for questions now, right, Doug? Yeah. Yeah. So, so this is just, look, this will be, this is all great information about uh, some food uh, suggestions, and you can access it uh, in the online. Okay. We have some, uh, some foods for the, around the menses, before and after, um, how to nourish, sexual energy and food to increase libido, always a good one. Patients love to know this. You can have a handout for your patients. They will, they will appreciate it. Um, and last but not least, obviously this is for another topic, but uh, Chinese medicine has great formulas to help with sexual, any kind of sexual dysfunction. So, uh, consult your local herbalist. Uh, and uh, if you're interested, by the way, we have a clinic and we, we do all, all, all of this. And there's some brochures you can pick up and cards. And uh, we also brought a free CD to give you as a gift. So if you want to pick one, it's a guided visualization. And you can, you're welcome to take one for yourself. It's a practice for, uh, for stress management, actually. It's a practice to check in with your heart for a few minutes at the end of the day relax all the stresses of the day and connect to your true feelings and it's a nice practice before bedtime so anyways that's uh what we have i think uh more 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 oh this is the decreased libido okay so this is the the, the blacklist <laughs> less of that all right here we are i think we've got to some questions and are we are we uh remind me are we actually got two, three minutes. oh yeah okay Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Thank you so much. Do you have anything to say about um, shamanistic perspectives on infatuation and what that does to life force? Uh, it's basically working with uh, the perception of where we are in the universe. Am I, am I, where is my place? Do I count? Am I sufficient with what I have or do I need more? And so we work with that. The, the perspective of shamanism is essentially that I am here in this room, but really it's about, not about the room. It's about my relationship to the universe, let's say, to the higher forces. And so if I am in good stand with, the, with that relationship, then the dynamics with, with this are going to take care of themselves. I'm not going to be needing too much or pulling too much. It regulates my, my, my needs in the, in the world uh, in, a, 
you know, because I have my connections. Like you, I have my, I have my friend. And I'm good. I don't need, right? I can do and have a great time in life and have a, an amazing relationship and experiences, but I'm not needy. I have my, I have my own connection, and that's I'm self-sufficient that way. I don't know if that helps you out. It's a long, it's a, it could be a longer answer, but that's an essential tidbit. Question about the recapitulation and like if it were a sexual trauma that we're, you're working with, yeah. Um, and what associations would kind of conserve that sexual energy? Um, how you would want to work with that sort of memory? Yeah, yeah. Well, a, a, a simple way when you're doing the recapitulation is um, in a case like that that has an emotional charge. Uh, one thing that you can do or can have a person do is put their hands on the heart as they are doing it, right? You can be laying down too, but just that you. Connecting to and you are in the presence of all the feelings as well, right? So you are here. You are reliving the, the experience, and then uh, whenever there's your standing in front of something that is triggering a lot of emotion, right? Uh, hurt or sadness or anger, then you, you pause there and you just work with the emotion, and you use the breath, and you go, okay, uh, I release, you know, all the the tension or the unwanted when you exhale, mm -hmm. and then I breathe in fresh and clean energy or or, or peace or or self-respect, right? So you use the breath to clean up the emotions, okay. and then you just and then you and then you, if it gets too overwhelming, then you pause, and it's okay, bookmark, let's say, mm -hmm. yeah, and then I'm, you don't try to muscle through it. Then you do again in a moment later or the next day. Or, so you work with whatever you, 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 you are able to engage in that moment, especially when there's higher emotions. And then in those cases also, you may need to go and re do the same thing more than once mm -hmm. until you feel like in being the presence of that episode, as you relive it, doesn't trigger so much emotions. Mm 